Thank you for coming to the fifth and final Hamilton Families Homelessness Awareness Month Community Forum. If you've been with us all along, welcome back. And if this is your first time, welcome to the party. November is Homelessness Awareness Month and Hamilton Families has organized a month long series of community forums as part of a larger effort to influence the policies and practices impacting families and communities experiencing homelessness. With the series, we also hope to strengthen the coalitions working to solve homelessness and build affordable housing in the Bay Area. We've invited elected officials and city department heads and the private sector, including corporations, foundations, NGOs, and activists to come together to address the unmet needs of people and communities experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. Today's episode of the series entitled Philanthropy and Family Homelessness will focus on the ways in which corporations and private foundations have been partners in the efforts to meet the needs of families experiencing homelessness in the San Francisco Bay Area. Panelists will discuss how foundations are looking at new, more creative and sustainable ways to support innovative and scalable efforts to end the twin crises of homelessness and affordable housing. Over the last few years, many foundations and corporations have made their philanthropic efforts more flexible and have removed barriers to access, making the application and reporting processes less burdensome and generally easing restrictions on how funds can be used. I'm not sure if this emerging pattern is a byproduct of the COVID-19 pandemic or if it began to emerge earlier, but hopefully we can talk today about the significance of what appears to be a philosophical sea change in how foundations and corporations are approaching their giving. As a grantee, I can say that this trust-based philanthropy, if you will, allows organizations like Hamilton Families to apply resources where they're genuinely needed, not only or entirely on program-related expenses. Many organizations in the nonprofit sector could use significant investments in infrastructure, staff and leadership development and impact evaluation that would improve their ability to provide critical services in their communities. This emerging trend allows them to do just that. It is my hope that today's forum will give us the opportunity, opportunity to dig more deeply into the many ways in which the philanthropic landscape is changing to meet the increasingly complex needs of people experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. Because our situation is so nationally visible, the Bay Area has a unique opportunity to show the rest of the country how to untangle the thorny mess of policies and practices that lead to the inequities we see when we look at homelessness and housing. That work is impossible without the input and partnership of foundations and corporations, which provide critical support that isn't covered by government funding. I'm your host, Carrie L. Noon, CEO of Hamilton Families, and it's my pleasure to moderate today's community forum. My partners in the conversation today are Adrian Shore, the Bay Area Giving Manager of Google.org, Thank you for joining us, Adrian. Also joining us today is Jackie Downing, Executive Director of Crankstar. Great to have you with us, Jackie. Uh, last but not least, we have Hamilton Family's very own Karina Moreno, Executive Director of Mimi and Peter Haas Fund and board member of Hamilton Families. Great to see you, Karina. Um, just for the audience, I'd like to ask each speaker to tell us, to talk to us for roughly three to five minutes each, and then we can engage in a conversation and incorporate any questions that may come from the audience. As the moderator, I may have to interrupt you or ask you to allow another speaker to make a point. Don't take it personally, just kind of keep us on track. Uh, if you're in the audience, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to get to them during the course of our time together today. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Adrian to get us started, so I will pass the mic to you. Hello, hello. Thank you so hey. much, Curiel and Hamilton, for, for having me here. Uh, super excited to, to join Jackie and Karina in, in this conversation, who are peers in the space, um, all doing incredible work and all committed to you know, supporting homelessness and alleviating and hopefully solving homelessness here. I come from Google.org, which is Google's philanthropy. Uh, I lead our regional giving and I lead our homelessness portfolio, which is focused primarily here in the Bay Area. We do a ton of work in this space. I think at this point, we're almost at $40 million over the past 10 years or so in, in giving just for local homeless uh, efforts. And we've done everything uh, from direct service to strategic ecosystem, to taking big bets and big shots and looking into things like cash transfers, which I know we'll talk about a little bit later. And um, you know, we're, we're our Google's philanthropy. And so I'd be remiss not to mention, you know, the, the commitment that Google as a whole put forward uh, for our billion dollar affordable housing uh, commitment here in the Bay Area, which includes both Google's capital, financial capital um, in, in terms of, you know, loan investments and, and, and whatnot, but also the philanthropic side, about $50 million committed over the next 10 years or so to really doing this work. Um, yeah, we, we can get into a little bit more about how we do and what we do and why we do, but really excited to, to join you all here today and to have this conversation. Thank you so much, Adrian. It's really exciting to hear what Google.org has been doing over the past many years. Um, I'd love to turn it over to Jackie Downing from Crankstart. Take a few minutes, introduce yourself, and tell us about your work and how you how you fit into the space. 
Hi, Carrie. It's great to see you and great to see all the supporters of Hamilton here today. Um, so my name is Jackie Downing, and I'm the executive director of the Crank Start Foundation. Um, and I'm really happy to be able to talk about homelessness today, which is a topic I'm really passionate about. And I've been working in philanthropy for about a decade. And actually, one of the very first grants I ever got to make on this topic was to Hamilton when I first started at the San Francisco Foundation 10 or 11 years ago. A donor had passed away and left a $3 million gift um, to support survivors of domestic violence and homelessness. And I was able to work with the, the team at SFF to fund a handful of organizations, including Hamilton. So that was one of my introductions to philanthropy. And it's just great to see what the organization has accomplished over the years since then. Um, you had originally said five minutes, so I wrote quite the long speech, but given how brief Adrian was, I think I'll probably skip most of it. Um, oh, please feel free to hold for it. We have plenty <laughs> of time. I'd love to hear from you. I'll just say, um, you know, I so I've been at Crankstart for I mean, two years while I was at SFF and then almost three years independently. Um, since I first met the donors in 2017, the foundation was initially pretty small, about the same size as the San Francisco Foundation at the time. Um, both organizations have grown and Crankstart has grown substantially to become one of the largest funders in the region. With six strategic program areas and several hundred grantees at this point, it's been such a whirlwind, it's honestly kind of hard to believe. Um, we have a small team that sources grant making opportunities by listening to community leaders, including Kiriel. We provide primarily multi year general operating support and we strive to use trust based practices that minimize bureaucracy. And each year we fund an increasing number of organizations led by people of color and frontline organizers. Our grantees range from established institutions such as UCSF to community driven civic engagement groups like Mega Black SF. Um, I don't know, I did write it like a whole bunch of background about why I care about homelessness. Do you want me to go into it or save it for later? Why not? Let's hear it. Yeah. Okay. It's just, it's context. It's good. So people, some of you may know, I wrote my master's thesis on preventing homelessness. So I, I really can go on for about 75 pages if you like. Um, so we at Crank Start believe that housing is a human right and a basic human need. We believe that housing and economic security are two sides of the same coin, and that to survive in the Bay Area, people need both stable housing and reliable income. We do not believe in the myth that people move to California to become homeless, nor do we believe that addiction and mental health are the primary causes of homelessness. We know that most homeless people in our community were born and raised here, and most lost their housing because of an economic shock, like a job loss or foreclosure. We know that homelessness disproportionately affects black individuals and families who are more likely to face eviction and homelessness and less likely to have their crisis resolved by our current homelessness response system. We believe that homelessness and the housing crisis are, are the result of systemic racism, from redlining to subprime lending, and that in recent years, stagnant wages and rising housing costs have exacerbated a legacy of income, wealth, and racial inequality pushing African-Americans into homelessness at disproportionate and alarming rates. We don't believe that philanthropy or any one sector for that matter can solve a crisis that has been so many decades in the making. But we do believe that it's everyone's responsibility to learn about this crisis and do their part. We believe that through collaboration across sectors, this problem can be solved. We know there's no silver bullet, but most of the solutions are in fact well understood. Building the political will to implement these solutions at scale is the challenge in front of us. It will take time, money, and effort, but it is absolutely a problem we can solve. Um, so I'm going to share a little personal background on the topic and why I'm so passionate about it. Um, so I, my first experience with housing insecurity was in middle school. My parents split up when I was 13 and my dad could not afford to rent an apartment. Um, so we actually couch surfed for two years before I was lucky enough to um, trade my straight A's in for a full scholarship to a boarding school in Massachusetts, uh, where I was one of about 10 kids um, on a scholarship surrounded with kids from the wealthiest families in the United States, from the kids, um, Celine Dion's child was there, Walmart kids were there, Smith and Wesson kids, I mean, you know, all these household names. Um, but I, you know, it's funny, I didn't realize it was going to be training ground for my later career in philanthropy working with wealthy families, um, but I got comfortable being around all that wealth at a young age because I knew that I'd really earned my spot there. And I was just so incredibly grateful for the housing stability. Um, you know, there was still a lot of instability going on in my family life outside of school, but I had a safe place to live and a roof over my head. And I always knew that I could house it for my teachers during school vacations if I couldn't go home. Um, 
so that was my first experience. Uh, my second was in college when I had the opportunity to get my first passport and travel abroad for the first time. It was actually one of my first plane rides um, where I went to Columbia, South America to work as a human rights observer. At the time, the country was in the middle of a 50 year civil war and there were more than a million Colombians living in the streets of Bogota. They, they used the term internally displaced persons, but really they were homeless, people who had been forced off their lands by the violence and who lived in shanty towns, apartment buildings. Sometimes they'd even take over nonprofit organizations, You know, fed up that the organizations were unable to help them. They would just take over their buildings and live in them. Um, and my third experience was in 2016 when homelessness just started to explode in the East Bay where I live. And all of a sudden the streets of Oakland looked like the streets of Bogota. And I just couldn't believe it because um, the Bay Area just being as wealthy and plentiful it is, it just could, I just couldn't believe that it was suddenly really looked like this third world country that I had been a human rights observer in in college. Um, at the time I was working at the San Francisco Foundation with an anonymous donor who was extremely passionate about helping Oakland. And we, you know, looking around, we sat down together and decided we wanted to do something about homelessness. And those conversations and that planning process that grew out of that eventually formed a group called Keep Oakland House that I helped to co-found and launch in, I think, I'm losing track now. I think that was 2018, 2019. Um, and lastly, well, I should mention, during that whole process of founding Keep Oakland House and working with that donor to give away hundred million in Oakland, I actually got evicted. <laughs> because I made too many complaints about the mold and flooding and electrical problems in my apartment. Um, and like so many other landlords at the time, uh, the people that I was renting from were just looking to kick me out and try to make more money from the next tenant. So um, while I was ironically starting this program to help other people, I was actually having my own experience with the Oakland housing crisis, which really just added fuel to my desire to do something about it. Because, you know, I was a single parent. It was definitely a struggle to figure out where we're going to live next. But I thank God had a good job in philanthropy and, you know, put something together. Um, but it gave me a little taste of what the stress that people who have fewer resources and less of a safety net were going through. And that just really added um, to my passion to do something about it. Um, so I'll stop there. But uh, Really great to, to be with all of you and glad for the work you're doing. Really great to have you with us, Jackie, and to hear your own sort of personal stories for the ads color to the work that you're doing uh, at the Crankstar and formerly with the San Francisco Foundation. So thank you for sharing. I really appreciate the, the personal side of it as well. Um, Karina, you the mic I will hand to you. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Karina Moreno, um, and I come to this issue, um, the experience in kind of different realms. Currently, I'm the executive director of the Mimi and Peter Haas Fund, and we certainly fund a lot of organizations working to alleviate homelessness here in San Francisco. But previous to this um, role, I spent eight years at Tipping Point Community, and many of you probably know um, that they also do a lot of work vis-a-vis uh, -vis homelessness. And in between those two gigs, I happened to to write a, a brief on housing justice in Silicon Valley for Silicon Valley donors. So really dove into this issue from, from the donor perspective. And then I would say most importantly and relevant, I'm a proud board member of Hamilton Families and have been for the last three years. And uh, honestly, it is the perch where I feel most connected um, to the work. Um, given all that we do in this realm. And I guess for me, I would say a couple of things. I mean, I've always taken the view in, in my 15 years of philanthropy that philanthropy is a very important supporter, helper, enabler, but we're not really the doer and we're rarely the expert on this issue. It really is the direct service providers, the policy advocates, and most importantly, unhoused individuals and families that themselves that really know the most about this issue. And I think one of the things that is most promising is um, the way in which even before the pandemic, but the pandemic accelerated, this notion of listening more to individuals that are experiencing homelessness. And I, I think that is a trend theme that um, is a positive one that I hope to see even more of in philanthropy. Um, and I think that's just really important for us always to keep in mind um, wherever we sit in philanthropy. Um, and then the other thing, you know, Curiel, you had mentioned in your opening comments of like, oh, I'm not sure whether this like less onerous reporting, more general operating support, more flexibility is a result of the pandemic or whether it was 
before the pandemic, I think it was definitely, this has been an issue of years in the making in philanthropy circles of the ways in which we in philanthropy do better to be more flexible and attentive to our grantees. However, like all things pandemic, you know, that cliche, it just exacerbated it or accelerated it. Um, and so I do think that that's one thing we've seen that um, we as a sector have gotten a little bit um, less um, hamstrung by processes and things that were normal before. Um, and then, you know, I think the, the word of like, philanthropy is at its best when it is operating flexibly. <laughs> and I think we sit in a place where we can be flexible. I mean, this whole notion of homelessness and how entrenched it is, you know, it is a government problem and our government needs to do more and it needs to do better. And it is ultimately, you know, I think the main player, not with not to say that all of us don't have a part to play, play but I think that our focus on government reform is important. Um, but what, where we come in as philanthropy is the flexibility that government often doesn't have. So providing risk capital, providing proof of concept to take things to scale. I think these are all the things that are really important for us to think about in any grant making, quite frankly, but certainly um, in homelessness. Um, so I'll just stop there and look forward to getting into the conversation. Thank you so much. I think you also, as both a provider, uh, you know, in your workspace and as you know, a board member of Hamilton Families have a very sort of unique vantage point to look at this issue. So I'm happy to have your, your voice around the table as well. So I'm going to open it up to the group. And maybe since Karina, you were just talking about how the pandemic sort of accelerated this process of sort of removing some of the more onerous bonds from, uh, from philanthropy, maybe we can start there and talk about what ways the pandemic has changed how foundations and corporate philanthropy uh, are working and how they're supporting yep. uh, folks experiencing homelessness. I mean, I think a few things of how the pandemic changed philanthropy. One, we've already said, right? It just, it, it um, got rid of onerous reporting, it moved more quickly, it, it um, pivoted toward general operating support. Many foundations that historically had not been doing that started doing it. Um, so kind of that process thing. Two, we saw a lot more direct cash, direct financial assistance. This is a huge thing. Whereas before it was always kind of, like, oh, do we give cash directly to people or finance? Like there was just this weird tentativeness around that strategy in philanthropy. And I think the pandemic really uh, opened the floodgates on that to show how important it was. Uh, it was desperately needed. And so a lot more foundations um, got in the game of supporting um, families directly with financial relief, rent relief, and sometimes straight up you know, cash or gift cards. And I know Adrian can talk a lot more about this, but I think that is a second trend that we saw. Um, I would say um, kind of getting more into policy and advocacy. Again, this is a trend that has been going on for a while, but I think the pandemic kind of showed that yes, direct services are important and there was a lot of flooding of direct service support. And at the same time, you know, being mindful of, of the both and strategy of supporting short term relief while also supporting longer term advocacy to change structures and move toward reform. Um, and then, of course, the centering of race in all of this, I think, um, became vitally important. And in the homelessness um, unhoused field, you know, particularly centering around Black and Indigenous communities, because those two groups are disproportionately represented in the data all across the country, and certainly here in the Bay Area. And so uh, philanthropy really having to look hard at that data and figure out how to be more attentive to the ways in which race intersects. Um, with homelessness. So those are just a few of the things that I've seen. If I could jump in and, and add uh, maybe an additional point to it. So uh, Karina was mentioning, you know, I think that the important piece to call out is also the, the political will has slightly changed, especially when it comes to things like mutual aid and immediate relief assistance. You know, this conversation two years ago, three years ago, man, you bring up cash assistance and it was the red flag that no one wanted to touch on both sides of the aisle for different reasons. And I think once the pandemic hit, we realized, wait, hold on, this is actually what's needed, right? A across the board, no matter what level of, of, of society you, you participate in, someone needed something and it wasn't gonna happen via a program, 
right? We didn't have time to hire, you know, more people, nonprofits or government didn't have time to hire more people to launch new programs that like everything was happening so quickly, but the need was only increasing that I think that political will change. Now we can have conversations to say, what does this actually look like? Can we pilot something? Or cities are, are coming up now with their own pilots of what it looks like to do this type of work. Whereas two years ago, I don't think it was quite there. So I think that that has has really come into the fold. And, and I really wanna underscore the, the point around kind of racial equity. You know, homelessness for the longest time has been this, you know, quote unquote, homogenous thing. It's homelessness and that's it. You know, there are very few people talking about, well, what does it look like to be a homeless person who's also undocumented? What does it look like to be a homeless person coming out of prison, a black homeless person? What do those experiences actually look like? And I'm so proud to say that that has changed. Every one of our grantees uh, and even just the broader ecosystem is having the conversation of what does it look like to have equity at the core of what it looks like to serve your population? Could be homeless families in Hamilton's case or homeless youth or whomever, chronically homeless folks. What does it look like to actually have equity be baked in at the core? And those conversations, those questions were not happening two years ago, or if they were, they were happening at small scales, but it's a part of the ecosystem. Now you can't have this conversation without talking about equity, which I'm, I'm really excited about. And one great example of that is with Curio's leadership, the way in which Hamilton families is really um, centering our work on, on black mothers, because that's, you know, um, a big, portion of the population that we serve. But to your point, Adrian, of like, how do we really focus in there? Um, and I agree that that's a, a positive phenomenon. Yeah, I totally, I, I wanna give Jackie an opportunity to chime in on this question as well. So stop our responses. I know you probably got some more to add here. Well, I mean, I agree with so much of what my colleagues have said. Um, I, I guess I would add that um, the urgency to scale the understood solutions certainly um, took off with COVID. So things like Project Home Key and this effort to house as many people as we possibly could in existing properties from hotels to other kind of conversions quickly that the state led, but philanthropy absolutely enabled. Um, you know, matching matching dollars were required to get each of these projects off the ground. We participated in quite a few of them. I know others did as well. Um, you know, a, giant number of people were able to move indoors because of that. And that program is now being replicated on an even larger scale. Um, so, you know, COVID added this, um, you know, fuel to what, you know, there was a desire there, but all of a sudden we showed ourselves really like, hey, we actually can do this when we put our minds to it. Um, I think that was really important in terms of, you know, reducing immediate homelessness. And then I think prevention, which is something I've been passionate about for a long time, like has really become like a common approach at this point where, you know, these rental assistance programs are happening nationally um, to help people to make rent or to at least not get evicted, if, even if they're behind on rent during uh, the emergency and to continue to extend that while we figure out a long-term solution. I mean, that just was not happening beforehand. There were very few rental assistance and prevention programs nationally. And, and now it's sort of a part of our system. And that happened a lot faster. I mean, that just, we wouldn't be where we are in terms of prevention becoming a commonplace solution um, if it wasn't for COVID. So, I mean, those are kind of the silver linings, I guess. Um, I, I do hope that eventually prevention is our number one go-to solution and that homelessness doesn't happen very often because we actually learn that it is preventable um, and we put most of our resources in, into preventing it in the first place. Um, and I, I think we're further along in that now than we would have been. Um, I think the other thing that the pandemic changed, at least for Crankstart, is this greater clarity that economic security is, is as important as housing security like most foundations and nonprofits, we had those in separate buckets previously. Our economic security grants were actually part of our education portfolio because it was mostly workforce training. And then we had our housing and homelessness work over here. And that's pretty typical if you look at the sector. Um, nonprofits and foundations tend to separate um, housing, homelessness, and economic security are actually three sectors typically. Um, we've decided to bring all of those together into one program area that we now call Just Communities recognizing that in the Bay Area, if you just stabilize someone's job situation or income, but not their housing, they're not actually very likely to succeed and vice versa. And I'm seeing that play out more and more with my colleagues and I and, and groups like All Home that we're a part of that, you know, Hamilton's former CEO, Tamika Moss founded. Um, that's really the premise of that organization. And I think that they are really getting, you know, steam and, and uh, taking off. And I think that's 
it seems so obvious, but I actually think it's a really significant turning point. Um, and we've started to fund groups that are experimenting with explicitly focusing those, focusing on those things hand in hand. So as an example, we fund Youth Employment Partnership in Oakland. They, for a long time, helped youth get um, a high school diploma and paid work experience and a job. Well, now they're also providing housing. We help them buy a building, which they're turning into a 30-person dorm, because they were actually finding that housing insecurity was the greatest challenge to the young people in finishing their program. Um, and I think there's just more and more opportunities for us to marry those two things together at a policy level and in our programmatic work. So I think that's been like a positive outgrowth of the pandemic. Totally. I agree so completely. One of, at one of the panels, I forget which one, we talked about the sort of siloing and the artificial siloing of housing versus homelessness versus economic security and how that does, that siloing does a disservice to all the people experiencing each of those, those issues. And I think, you know, this moment that you're describing, Jackie, sort of, you know, bringing all those pieces together, I think is really the sign of like a deeper insight into the problem because we can't, you can't, if you don't solve for all three, you're not really solving for any of them, honestly. And, and we see this playing out in our work here at Hamilton all the time. I, I have a question about some of which, which I think two of you have talked about political will. And there, a couple of weeks ago, there was a New York Times article about uh, progressive cities and how you know, we just don't do well. Our policies really screw up, screw our people. And can we talk about that for just a second? Is in your experience, do you see sort of a disparity between sort of uh, people sort of stated philosophical bents and the practices in the real world? Like, do you see that with donors? Like, did you guys see this article that I'm talking about? Yes, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was a little disturbing, but. There's so many myths and garbage out there about homelessness and what causes it and who's homeless and why. And, you know, obviously the author of the book that they were reviewing is just spewing a lot of those untruths. Um, what frustrated me about um, that overall like point of view is that it has, I don't think it has anything to do with it being democratic or progressive. It has to do with wealth and, and housing inequality. I mean, what we have in common, these regions that have a housing and homelessness crisis is the stratification between the haves and the have nots. That's what we have in common, not who's in office. I think that you could analyze why maybe people who are more highly educated and wealthy tend to vote democratic because there are some correlations there, but, but it's the wealth, it's the gap. It's the fact that some people have three houses, including an apartment in San Francisco that they rarely stay in you know, that and other people have no place to live. Like that's what we have in common, you know, with New York and other places and LA and other places that have the housing crisis. And so the analysis that just points at um, people's personal failures, I just, that's not what causes homelessness. And uh, if you misdiagnose the problem, you're certainly not going to come up with viable solutions. I didn't read the article, but generally when I get questions like this, I think my natural response is, you know, folks also miscategorize what homelessness is. They think it's just the person on the street asking for a dollar or someone who has, you know, substance abuse issues. That is not homelessness. That's one sliver of homelessness, but homelessness looks so different. Uh, but we treat it as if it's just this one portion of the puzzle and all of this hate is spewed. We, we uh, demonize poverty so much in this country and in our society, and especially when it comes to homelessness, that instead of having the humanity, the humanity to try to understand someone's dignity and to meet them where they're at and address their human needs, we just spew it as though it's a political problem or we're not doing enough or that's their problem or just get out of my front doorstep and that'll be fine, right? Like we, we, we need to start approaching this from a dignity perspective and really understand what homelessness is and what it's not. It is not just that person on the corner asking for a dollar. It looks so much different. And the strategies that we need to put forward and the narratives we need to put forward also need to change. And Curiel, you know, I'm thinking about the project that we did with you all a couple of years back, right before COVID hit where we took a big bet and said, do some storytelling. <laughs> we don't know what it looks like. You know, it could be a podcast, could be a short film, could be a documentary, but we need to, to, to really personify what homelessness looks like. And I'm, I'm not sure if y'all have already brought this up, but that led to this incredible set of short films that really showed what it's like to actually be 
a homeless family, a, a, a family with housing instability and what that perspective is like from a parent, from a mother, from a father, from a child's perspective, really to bring that dignity and that voice into perspective. And what started off as a you know whiteboarding session with me and a couple of folks from Hamilton Families ended up on the New York Times getting picked up as, as a short film, uh, I think of, of the day or of the week or something. And you know, really just personifying what it means to actually be homeless and how we see ourselves in, the, in, in, in folks like this. And you know, until we see ourselves in that, we, we're not actually gonna do something to, to draw some change to it. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of you know, changing narratives and, and really personifying um, you know, this, this portion of our community, which is our community. Yeah, I totally agree. I think one of the, you know, we have been talking about policy, we've been talking about, you know, sort of government involvement, but there's also a very human piece of it where there's a, you know, a, a, a piece of it that's about empathy, about put, you know, putting yourself in another person's shoes in a really sort of substantive way, sort of thinking, what if that were me or my daughter or my nephew or whatever? And I think that that's the part of it that is around the change in the narrative that can address that sort of, you know, bridging the empathy gap, as I like to call it, you know, that that sort of that's where that work is important. Um, I think the policy question, though, is another one that I think I think is really important. Um, you know, here at Hamilton, we talk about, you know, programs on the ground um, and policy work are two sides of the same coin, right? That if you, you can continue to provide services until you're blue in the face, but unless you change the structures in which those programs are needed, you're not really changing the problem. And I think, you know, to the extent that we can talk about it here about philanthropy, can we talk about the ways in which maybe philanthropy can help uh, move policy efforts forward? Because I know it's, it can be touchy for some organizations and for some funders, you know, it gets political and people don't like to be political. So how can we, how can we talk about that with our, with our funders in the philanthropic sector? I'm happy to jump in with a couple of examples if that's helpful. I'm, I'm excited to hear from Karina and Adrian too. Um, I work for donors that have historically been a little bit uncomfortable in the policy space. And yet at the same time, they completely understand that only government can take programs to scale. Um, and so what the, the niche that I found for us where they feel comfortable is public private partnerships, where we demonstrate that a solution works or we test something that we have a hunch might work that's ba you know, based on evidence. Uh, we pay for the program, the collaboration and the evaluation, and we work with our government partners throughout it. And if it's successful, then they can turn it into policy and try to take it to scale. And we don't typically stay involved at that stage, but we provided that runway for them. And so a, and, and I think that's great. You know, it's we need every kind of donor and every kind of foundation. And it's really about like playing to your strengths. And so that's where they feel comfortable and they've been able to make a big impact. It's not to say we don't fund any policy groups. We do fund groups like MPH, which do really wonderful work. But for the most part, they want to stay fairly local. And so that's why doing demonstration projects has been an effective role for us. A couple examples are Keep Oakland Housed, which started as a pilot program, but is now becoming permanent and has deployed, I'm losing track, I mean, tens of millions now with all the, the state and federal assistance that's flowed through the program. Um, you know, that was just purely, uh, it's, it's as if we had a crystal ball, you know, we built the infrastructure to do emergency rental assistance to prevent evictions and homelessness, not knowing that COVID-19 would hit and make that program in such high demand. Um, but that was an important role that Crankstart played. Um, now we're working with Adrian and his team and others to do a shallow subsidies program in Oakland. Um, helping to close the gap. So uh, one option, right, if you provide a subsidy to someone is to give everybody the same amount. And that was the original concept when Oakland was coming up with their shallow subsidies program. Um, but the more we thought about it, and as we partnered with UCSF, who's doing the evaluation, the more we realized that, you know, everyone's rent is a different amount and people's incomes are a different amount. We know there's, you know, extremely low income is 30% or below area median income, you're considered housing burdened if you're paying 50% or more of your income towards housing. So we decided rather than give everybody the same flat rate, we would reduce everyone's housing burden to 50% and see if that paying that difference would be enough to keep people from losing their housing. And this experiment has just begun. But this is a great example where shallow subsidies are a known tool. They've been used in in things like the fight against HIV and AIDS to keep people who have AIDS, you know, housed and able to live out the rest of their days in dignity with a small subsidy that makes up for whatever public benefits they're on and helps them pay that difference so that they can remain housed. It's a known solution, yet it's never been done at scale to prevent homelessness. So this is an example where 
Um, it's, I it was actually the city of Oakland that really wanted to do it, but they turned to philanthropy and their, their partners at UCSF to work together on the design to provide that upfront capital. And now we get to test it, see if it works. And if it does, we'll just stand back and cheer while they take it to scale as a public policy. So I think that, you know, that's, that's the role that we feel comfortable playing. And I think it, it's been effective. And I could give you a few other examples. We're supporting the Abundant Birth Project that it supports um, pregnant Black uh, women in San Francisco who are struggling with homelessness and housing insecurity with also with direct cash assistance. So there's quite a few of these examples. And I think, you know, that's one of the parts of philanthropy that really excites me because it's that opportunity to take that flexible money that we have, try something, build a body of evidence, and then turn it over to our partners in the public system to scale. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I do think that there's a lot more comfort and interest in policy advocacy in all of its forms. I feel like there's this weird notion out there that like uh, policy or advocacy is lobbying, right? And it's not just that, it's actually mostly not that. It's um, uh, kind of voter education. And here on this issue, I think a lot about it in the realm of, um, you know, what we're up against with housing and homelessness is a supply and demand issue, right? We do not have enough housing. And we know that we hear in many ways the poster child for nimbyism, not in my backyard. So we have a lot of efforts out there that kind of say no to housing whenever it comes um, up. But there's a lot of work on the ground, organizing groups, local uh, neighborhood associations that are really galvanizing and organizing to say yes to housing. And that in and of itself is a really important body of work that many community foundations and donors um, are getting behind. So that's one way where we see, you know, this issue of policy in this space of, you know, how do we uh, activate people saying yes to housing and acknowledging that we need more density in our housing, more transit oriented housing, um, all these things. I mean, look at single family zoning and how much that topic of conversation, I mean, every week I see an article in, in the New York Times or in the Chronicle or somewhere really kind of um, exposing the origins of this issue, which are really important to understand, and then how kind of to fix it. Um, the other thing I'll say about policy and advocacy kind of work, and Jackie, I think you really did a good job of talking about how there's a lot of kind of like getting it ready and then giving it up to kind of government to scale. The other realm where I think philanthropy can play a role is actually um, implementing and enforcing policies. I mean, it's one thing to like get a law changed or a regulation. And then a lot of times I think the hardest work is getting it implemented and making sure it has teeth. And that is a lot of kind of research and information dissemination. Um, so that's another area that I think philanthropy is getting a little bit more sophisticated in. I could jump in here, um, you know, from a corporate philanthropy perspective, it, it gets a, a little more uh, complex and complicated when talking about, you know, advocacy work. Um, but from my perspective, I think where I've found, um, and, and Jackie, you mentioned this in, in, in your point too, is that impact evaluation is that critical portion of this conversation, because you really can't get to scale, especially when you're talking about government, unless you have a proven model doing things like randomized control trials and you know, uh, uh, kind of peer reviewed findings, all that stuff, which is incredibly complicated and complex and very expensive and not a lot of funding gets directed towards efforts like that, especially when they're led by nonprofits. So you know, being able to support organizations in their own exposure and in their own conversations to what would it look like to introduce impact evaluation for XYZ programs, or we wanna pilot this new funky thing we don't know what the effects are going to be. We don't know how to measure it. We don't know how to get to that point, but we know there's something here. That's where folks like us can step in and say, great, we trust you, Curiel. You come to us and you say, hey, you want to test out cash transfers? Awesome. Let's get you looped in with the right partners, with the right set of data, with the right uh, you know, models to get you to a point where you can go have that conversation with whomever it is to take that, that program to the next level. So for us, it, it also just gives us a, a smart play to, to be able to say, not only are we investing in the programmatic direct support, but we're also investing in proving out that this stuff works. And without that, it's really hard to get to that next level. So that's it. that's where we, we found a, a good strain to, to ride in. Yeah, I think this notion about public-private partnerships is really key. I think this is kind of the, it's kind of the sweet spot where we're seeing we can loop in uh, public sector and private sector and really sort of get things done. Um, and I think it does alleviate some of the discomfort around doing doing policy work that people feel is political. I think um, 
one of the questions I was going to ask about the sort of changes that we're seeing in philanthropy, particularly around centering race, race equity. To what extent did that happen as a result of that crazy summer of George Floyd's murder when there was like sort of a national, even an international sort of outcry about, you know, the necessity for racial equity to be centered in all aspects of American society. And all of a sudden we start seeing, you know, Black Lives Matter hashtags everywhere and corporations are trotting out all the, you know, these things. And this was a very new sort of attention on this effort. And I wonder if you could speak to maybe, you know, did that have an effect in the philanthropic sector as well? And, you know, to what extent did that alter you know, business as usual for, for your work. I, I could jump in. Um, it absolutely had had an impact. Uh, you know, I think, and, and, and important to call out that, you know, that George Floyd moment is one moment in a, in a history of moments. And so this conversation has been bubbling up and boiling, uh, specifically on the Google side. And we were one of the first uh, corporate philanthropies to step up uh, in, in the wake of the Charleston shootings, if y'all remember back in, in the mid, uh, uh, 2014, 15, um, and no one, no one was really doing it, especially on the corporate side. And so for us, we've had that conversation baked into the social impact conversation. I think what George Floyd, uh, the George Floyd moment did was it brought that conversation to another level, right? You started having this conversation at board levels. You started having the conversation, uh, in outcomes, expectations, you had it. You had that conversation. We started, you know, doing things like, hey, when we're, uh, uh, you know, looking at a, at a potential grantee, what does your board look like? You know, you could say that you serve Black people, but do you have any Black people in positions of power and leadership positions? You know, because until we get to that point where it's fully reflected all the way through, not just on the nonprofit side, but also on the philanthropy side, you know, until we get to that point, can we actually have a conversation about what equity truly means in its format? The, the, the conversation shifted. I mentioned this a little bit earlier in one of my earlier points, but, you know, when I would ask, you know, what does it look like for, for you know, your Black homelessness, for example, like, are you doing something specific for, for your Black community? The question was always, we serve Black people. Black people are a part of our, you know, demographic and here are the number of, you know, Black, black folks that we serve. There was never any conversation about equitable outcomes, Black specific pilots that are addressing this from a systems level, a narrative change, a community first focus, there was never any of that conversation. And so I think what that did was it really shifted it on its head to where even white led organizations are now having those conversations saying, what do we need to do to actually implement racial equity within our systems? Not just from a baseline outputs perspective, but really through the core, through the outcomes that we're tracking, how we're talking about this work, who we're hiring, all that good stuff. So it, it definitely was an important part for sure. to jump in unless you want to go well i don't have i mean i think adrian said it beautifully i do think that was a moment but as he noted it was important to acknowledge that there were moments before george floyd where organizations institutions individuals you know i um were I, i'm not i'm trying not to use the word but i'm using having a reckoning with um you know, with um, our racial history in this country and coming to terms with all of our culpability and all of the ways in which we as individuals, organizations and institutions, um, you know, have to interrogate kind of our role in all of that. And, and it is true, Adrian, it's just been interesting to like think about, I do think the conversations are becoming a lot more meaningful and, you um, intentional on these issues and we have a long way to go right All, both of those things are true um, and it's not just about diversifying our teams and our staffs and our boards although that is important um, it's it's not the end all be all and, and it, you know one fear I have is like sometimes it just we can so easily just make it about that about you know um, the the diversity within organizations but I think more importantly it needs to be about the habits, behaviors, policy structures within uh, organizations. Um, but certainly um, there's, there is a change afoot and it's not done in any stretch of the imagination. I'll just add that, you know, when I met the donors that I worked for in 2017, they were very clear that they wanted to focus on African-Americans and immigrants because of their personal backgrounds. Um, and they were also very clear that they wanted to fund the most effective organizations with the best leaders. And it's always been my belief, like the, it comes from the disability rights movement, this phrase, nothing about us without us. The communities, the leaders that are best 
the, who know the solutions, who know the communities are the ones who live in the community and, and work in these organizations because they truly are part of the community and represent the people they serve. And so that's the very first thing we always look for when we're choosing grantee partners. And so our grantees have always been racially diverse and increasingly so since we've added staff. Um, what I think shifted for us in the past year and a half was that it wasn't just George Floyd, it was the election happening at the same time. And it was this realization that we actually need to not just focus on service, but on building power. Because we can fund all the black led orgs serving black communities, but if black people still don't have power and they can die at the hands of the police and they can be disenfranchised in states when they try to go and vote, then we're not actually getting the job done. You know, we're providing really valuable services, but we're not really changing the underlying conditions. So I would say that was the big shift for us was, yes, keep our racial justice focus, but, but become more aware of the democracy and the civil rights and civic engagement issues and start to fund more power building groups. Um, and so for us, that looked like joining the Democracy Frontlines Fund, which is a national effort with, I don't know, a dozen or so foundations. We pooled our funds to support 10 Black-led um, democracy groups throughout the country. It was started by Crystal Haling at the Lieber Foundation. Um, it's a wonderful fund and it has an ongoing learning community for funders, which has been great. Um, and we also joined the California Black Freedom Fund, which funds um, Black-led civil rights and democracy organizing throughout California and quite a few other pooled funds. And joining a pooled fund is, is really important because donors are actually letting go of control when they do that. They're pledging money to a cause, but they're turning the decision-making power over to the group that advises on that fund. And we've had, we've probably joined 15 or so of these in the last year and a half or so. Um, and I, I think that is also a really important thing that's happening throughout philanthropy that has to do with both the racial reckoning, the crisis of democracy, and I think these shifts that are happening in philanthropy around realizing the power dynamics and that it's... Um, it's like who you give to, but it's also how you give and that the shifting some of that control and decision making over to community through these pooled funds and other intermediaries is a really important part of that. Can I just chime in and it struck me something you said, Jackie, when you started, you talked about how, um, you know, your donors from the onset were very about racial justice and they were also about um, choosing the most effective and best nonprofits and our leaders. And that's really interesting to me because I do think there's a history in our sector of, of those words being a little uh, coded and problematic in terms of what is best and what is most effective. And historically it is the biggest groups are the best or white led organizations have somehow become you know synonymous of that. That is, but it's reminding me that has also been a big change, right? I think we're also really seeing throughout philanthropy that um, there's an important role for small grassroots um, BIPOC led organizations that have been overlooked historically that are now getting their kind of fair share of attention. Again, we could do a lot more here, um, but it's just interesting checking ourselves, myself included in terms of like what I might have originally thought of like as the most effective group or the best leader um, and really thinking about our the biases we all bring to the table when, when we think about that and present things to our board. So it's really interesting to, um, I think that's also, a, I just wanted to mention a change that I see happening. Absolutely. I mean, thank you. This is, uh, we, I could go on about this for hours, but I know we're getting to the end of our time together. I want to um, acknowledge that we've got a question in the Q&A box. Um, and the question here says, I appreciate the conversation around preparing the workforce, economic security, and subsidies, and we'll have to learn if and or how funders have supported nonprofits to build capacity for this work. You know, these are not always built into organizational models. You guys want to take a crack at the, that question? Uh, I mean, since I kind of brought this up, uh, we really came to this realization that our economic security grants were not going to be effective on their own um, during the first summer of COVID. So not this summer, but the one before. Um, what we did was we looked at about 40 or 50 workforce development programs about we would probably supported 15 or so of them. So we looked at the ones we'd supported before and then the larger ecosystem and basically concluded that the Bay Area is lucky to be home to some incredible programs but none of them are serving very large numbers of people, you know, a few hundred in the very largest. And that, you know, given COVID's, you know, at that time, you know, enormous numbers of people that were unemployed, 
um, scaling any one of those programs wasn't going to really make a dent in the issue. And that's when we started to look at things like cash assistance and working with the state to increase the number of people who were filing their taxes so that they could get um, tax benefits that they qualified for but would have otherwise missed. We started to turn to those sorts of solutions that we felt could serve people at scale. Um, but what we did do for our workforce development grantees was we encouraged them, we gave them a couple months time um, to propose to us something that they could do to meet the housing and security needs of their clients um, for whom completing the economic development program that they offered was it where housing was the big barrier. Um, and we introduced a lot of them to housing leaders and just encouraged them to brainstorm. And we put together a group of people to read the proposals who had some background in each of the different topic areas. And then we ended up funding the ones that seemed like the most viable, where it was a group that had only done economic security work, but they wanted to add some housing service, either through a partnership or like I gave the example of a group that chose to buy a building. Um, and then after that, we've just continued to really make a lot of introductions between groups. And you'd be amazed how often this comes up. I mean, we met with CEO last week. They um, provide job opportunities to people coming out of incarceration. And, you know, that remains one of their biggest challenges, but they are still not a housing org. And so they truly do rely on those partnerships. And I know we sometimes as funders assume that all the nonprofits know each other, but folks often don't. They're super busy doing their work. And I do not believe in forced marriages. I will never make anyone meet with anyone else if they don't want to. But a lot of times people are dying for those introductions and they need that warm introduction and that real encouragement. And um, so I know it sounds simple, but that's been basically our approach right now is just pretty much like relationship building, giving people the opportunity to think creatively and apply for funding that they maybe wouldn't have otherwise sought. And then, you know, making grants um, when people come up with an idea that we think is really viable. Thank you. I, I also, I appreciate, you know, this approach. I know that Adrian and Google.org has been doing some work around this as well. Even with us, I know we are working on, you know, building our own sort of cash assistance program. And Adrian, I maybe wanted, wanted, if you wanted to talk a little bit about how successful the cash assistance programs have been in your experience so far. Yeah, no, I appreciate you uh, calling that out. So um, the, the, the cash transfer concept has been around for a long time, especially when you're talking about international work and international relief, uh, refugee crisis, any crisis, ca cash assistance internationally is usually one of the first go-tos. For some reason, we haven't quite adopted that when it comes to local or national efforts. And then the pandemic hit, and then there was a federal stimulus check, and then, and then, and then. So the conversation has shifted a bit. There isn't a lot of data, uh, specifically when it comes to cash assistance plus homelessness or housing insecurity or housing stability in a local context. And that's what we're hoping to build out right now. So Kiriel, you mentioned that, you know, this, this project that we're you know, in the midst of right now. It's pretty clear our local leaders are saying we got to prove this stuff out. We got to do a tons of impact evaluation. We know this works. We just have to get the data to be able to support this idea to really take it to that next step. And so for us, being able to translate some of that work that we saw, you know, with groups like Give Directly or even nationally with groups like formerly Family Independence Initiative, now known as Up Together, who really have this structure and system that says this works. Turns out if you target the right folks, if you give them the right support, Sometimes it's not just cash, it's cash and the social support around it. We can actually prove out the efficacy of this that would outweigh any public benefit or any public program that you could throw at it. So then the answer or, or the question then becomes, how do you get to that point where you shift the big dollars to make that change? And we've seen some of that happen in certain geographies when it comes to cash assistance and low income families. We haven't quite seen that yet with homelessness. There's a study up in Canada that really tried with youth homelessness to do um, uh, cash transfers in the thousands of dollars to youth, and they've seen some pretty uh, some pretty incredible uh, outcomes there. There's also a, a study over in New York um, that that is looking at youth homelessness specifically, but there's nothing here locally that that is quite getting at that, or, or has gone through a round or two of impact evaluations to prove that out. And so for us, it became quite clear, Curiel. You know, how would you all do this? We know you do this to a certain extent. You know, what, what would it look like to formalize it? What would it look like to have dedicated program managers to, to run this? What would it look like to create a partnership with an impact evaluator or a research institution? What would it look like to pay for that? Because we know you don't have that baked into your budget now. Like really taking a full holistic approach to say, what do you need to solve this thing? And what do you need to, to get to that next level? 
let me get out of your way. Let me cut a check and get out of your way because you know how to do it way better than anyone else does. But that's really what we what we think is like the next step for this. So we're we're pretty hopeful that you know some of these results and you know Jackie you mentioned some of the kind of tangential cash transfer programs that are happening. Um, some of the early results have been incredible, especially when you look at equity and who's being served and to what extent. So we're really excited about the potential, but it's still a little too early to really plant a flag in the ground and say this is it. Here's what it looks like. Definitely. I mean, and we're excited to you know, be in this conversation with you um, and trying to build that sort of body of, of knowledge around, you know, making or improving the concept, you know, at a local level. Um, I want to acknowledge that we've got one more question here in the Q&A. It says, since everyone has a role to play to help prevent homelessness, is there anything written that lays out what each of us, individuals, local businesses, banks, block clubs, local NGOs, restaurants, landlords can do? Anybody want to chime in with a potential from a written resource? Nothing is coming. That's a great question, um, it, it, especially given the very specific kind of entities that you listed. Um, I mean, I feel like there's stuff out there about what donors can do, but not the full gamut of, of what is being described, um, but I can think on it. It probably would require cut and pasting written resources from different places, because I bet there's something like what small businesses can do, what individuals can do, what donors can do. Um, yeah, we'll have to do some research on our side. Maybe post something on our website, uh, you know, on the on the community forum page to sort of get at some resources that folks might might access later. Um, I also wanted to mention briefly that uh, the films that you talked about earlier, Adrian, that Google.org helped fund and support. Um, one of those films, the, the one called What You Remember. Uh, got listed last week by the Hollywood Reporter as an Oscar contender. So we're changing the narrative, not just on a local level, but potentially at a huge scale. So, you know, really appreciate the support for that film. It is, it, it, who knows? It, it, it could be, it could win an Oscar. <laughs> How crazy would that be? Um, but anyway, I just wanted to drop that, you know, as a, a little brief note of joy in our, in our conversation of dark and heavy things. Um, I want to, it's one o'clock and I want to acknowledge and respect your time. Thank you so much, Jackie and Adrian and Karina for being here with us today and for sharing your insight and your input. Uh, really sort of interesting and important conversation. And I think it's just the beginning of a conversation and hopefully um, I think if my staff have their way, this will be an annual community forum series. So I might be inviting you back next year for more of this. Um, thank you so much for your time and, and have a great rest of the week. Talk to you Thank soon. Thank you. Thank you and your team so Thank much you. for the work you're doing. Thank you guys. Take care. Take care, y'all. Yeah.